Uh, special thanks, of course, to Donna and Olivia and crew who somehow navigated this week-long adventure in the Magic Canoe. Way to go. Um, uh, special thanks to, of course, particular thanks to our distinguished panelists tonight. Um, there are among us uh, those who have benefited enormously from traditional philanthropy. Uh, those who have uh, both asked and given in that relationship. Uh, those who just seem to give and give and give some more. And some who really all of the panelists who have helped create new ways to engage uh, more people, more resources by investing a broad spectrum of capital across uh, a, a wide range of uh, public benefit returns. Um, our panelist bios are listed on the website. Um, it's a pretty extraordinary group. Um, before introducing them, let me just say that uh, having made uh, a living for almost 50 years with my hand out, um, oftentimes both hands out, um, I want to be sure to express my personal gratitude to the to the many, uh, many people who've supported my own explorations through very traditional forms of philanthropy, foundations and individuals and, and uh, corporations and the wide range of uh, program related investments and uh, mission related investments and new market tax credits and debt for nature swaps, all the ways we've invented to try to find more resources. But uh, I've been trying to design and create more effective and fundamental ways to upend uh, all of our industrial institutions that so perhaps includes uh, uh, some of the patterns of traditional philanthropy um, so that we might build uh, more systematic approaches to a healthier relationship to uh, both people and planet. Across the, gro the globe, uh, there are of course, hundreds of billions hundreds of billions being given to worthy causes uh, every year. Uh, many of you probably saw this morning the announcement from Jeff Bezos uh, uh, that his $10 billion Earth Fund just committed $100 million to each of five of the most prominent environmental nonprofits. That's extraordinary, um, 10 billion, $100 million gifts round it up in a nice way that way, oh, hooray. Um, I know those organizations will make, uh, do a lot of good work with that. At the same time, uh, I think we're all faced with the task of creating new institutions in this uh, age of the Anthropocene. Um, it requires not just more money, but uh, importantly, new relationships, new ways of thinking about our relationships with each other and with the life support systems of which we are a dependent and inseparable part. We need to imagine how to enhance and reconnect cultural, social and ecological capital along with financial capital to exponentially accelerate the fuel necessary for what we might call regenesis. I uh, personally don't um, favor uh, the word charity, because if we are dependent on alms, we can't succeed in what has to be a profound shift. Um, I hesitate to use the term revolution to describe the shift that's necessary. Uh, Jane Jacobs, uh, uh, once the, the great author and, and observer of economic development, um, she once told me that revolution destroys evolution creates. So perhaps coevolution is a better term of the shift that we're looking for. One of our old friends used to call, used to say we were double clutching our way through the paradigm shift. Usually it felt more like an old truck and um, uh, standard gears trying to get out of the mud. Um, what uh, the Iroquois uh, Confederacy faith healer or alliance calls uh, this moment is value change for survival. I don't think there are four words that better um, describe our current predicament. Value change for survival implies more than money. 
the arithmetic of, uh, of 100% of money wrecking things and thinking that 5% might fix them simply doesn't add up. Um, so uh, we need to uh, rebuild relationships that seek systemic uh, solutions. I don't know how many of you saw the session this morning with Shannon and Kesey and Jacob uh, describing their initiatives up there in Skeena country around food sovereignty, little fractals and powerful fractals about uh, uh, pasture raised chickens and, and uh, growing fresh vegetables. An incredibly wonderful description of, of, uh, of a systems approach uh, to the challenge ahead. Um, so what we're doing, of course, here in this uh, week-long paddle in the Magic Canoe is to try to reimagine re the, uh, the straight lines of nation states, of, um, of, of colonialization and war and politics uh, towards the uh, wiggly and we think more beautiful lines of nature states, what we call salmon nation. So the question that I propose to the panelists today is uh, fairly simple. Um, how might we redefine or reimagine philanthropy? Literally, uh, philanthropy means the love of people towards what um, Ed Wilson, the great biologist says, biophilia, the love of all life, all life, including the life support systems of which we are part. Uh, so we will all have uh, eight or 10 minutes of remarks over the next 50 minutes. Then at three, we'd like to open it up for the panel's broader discussion and for questions uh, from those who have joined us. Um, I know there are at least uh, one of our panelists that has to leave at three, uh, which of course the original time that we advertised, but like all advertising, uh, 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 truth in advertising, um, we're gonna do our best to uh, end actually at 3.30 and give us time for questions. So, um, uh, Galina Ang uh, Angarova, um, we are deeply grateful to you for joining. Uh, thank you so very much. Um, we'd be grateful if you would um, uh, introduce yourself uh, and share your thoughts about the way we might reimagine philanthropy as we know it. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, and be part of this panel. Uh, my name is Galina Angarva. Um, I'm an indigenous rights activist. I come from the Iherit nation of the Buryat people in Siberia. My people lived on both sides of Lake Baikal, the largest freshwater lake in the world containing 20% of the world's freshwater. They lived there for millennia. And uh, today I'm speaking from the Ohlone land, uh, which is now known uh, the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. I am also the executive director of Cultural Survival. Uh, uh, we are an indigenous rights organization that has been working with indigenous peoples on their self-determined development, uh, on protecting their cultures and political resilience since 1972. Um, and so I come to this story, to this panel with um, two layers of uh, experience in philanthropy. So the most recent one, I, uh, before joining Cultural Survival last, last October, I came um, with an experience working in private philanthropy as a program officer. And uh, there I learned the craft of grant making. Uh, um, I managed the portfolio of 75, up to 75 partner grantees in Africa, in South America, in uh, US and Canada. And I learned how to do due diligence. I learned how to solicit applications and, and talk and uh, talk to the uh, uh, partner grantees. Uh, and it was, it was the easiest part for me because I come from the movement of indigenous people. So a lot of the people who were the partner grantees are actually were my really close relationships, my close connections on the ground. Uh, so, but I wanna speak to the, my first experience in philanthropy. And it comes from my culture. Although there is not a word in my, in, in my native language, I think that all of the indigenous language, languages, um, it doesn't exist. The notion and the word doesn't exist, but 
what exists is the, uh, the original instructions from our ancestors, the principles and values that guide us and instruct us in our daily lives. And uh, our relationship to the environment, our relationship, our close relationship to the land, that's what instructs us to be philanthropic in our lives. So I grew up with, with, with my grandmother in a village and I, we have about 500 people in our village and my grandmother's village is on one side of, uh, of the village and the furthest um, house from her house about two miles away. And we would run around with a bunch of kids, 10, 15 of us playing in the river, running in the forest, playing in the dirt. And at any given moment, we were watched, cared for by all of the grandmothers in the village, all of our grandmothers. And I wouldn't know where it would end up at the end of the day or during lunchtime, what part of the village. It was, it was a pretty big settlement but I knew that I would get my lunch somewhere, that one of the grandmothers would take us, the entire bunch of 10 to 15 kids in the house and feed us. So that's to me, that's what philanthropy means to me. So another story is that my grandmother had always had an excess of milk, sour cream, um, farmer's cheese, and she would always share it out to other members of community always. And we were getting this, uh, other things in return, like meat, wild mushrooms, wild blueberries. And at any given time, all of the members of community had enough food, you know, and the variety of foods because we were supplying each other. And up until 70s and 60s, during the Soviet uh, times in Russia, uh, money in my community didn't play a huge role. It's when my mother's generation moved to the city and started sending money back to the community, the relationship and the dynamic changed. And I was thinking about it. Why? Why is this happening? Because there was a shift from the gift economy to the money economy. So the, when the money started flowing and shifted the dynamics in the community, uh, in what I understand from that situation, the, the gift is, economy is actually comes from the mindset of abundance. And when you, and the money, unfortunately, there is scarcity component already embedded in it. Hence, and exactly at that time when the shift happened, we saw the rise in alcoholism among the members of like our community. And I, I do believe there is a direct link and people started sharing less. So the question for me arises, um, the statement uh, and the question that there's definitely a disconnect between Western concept of philanthropy and the indigenous way of or ways of giving. And the question is, how would you bridge the two in the current state of things? We live in the money economy and, and find opportunities and solutions to remedy the future of philanthropy. So that's my question. And I do have some of the answers. I also want to invite everybody to chime in. Uh, it's a conversation. I want it to be an, as interactive as possible among the panelists. And also, I would like to have some questions from and uh, inputs from the audience. But I can list some of the solutions, too. Uh, would, that, would that be OK, Spencer? And how much time do I have? Yeah, or you know, if we could. Um, uh... Galena, I think we'll collect the um, the questions and 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 uh, more of the panelist uh, interaction to or towards the end. And we'll mm -hmm. bring all those together because unfortunately uh, uh, <laughs> we have to kind of march our way through with all the panelists and mm -hmm. then come back to exactly that. I think you hit on one of the exact the most important questions of all. Of course, is this <laughs> grand shift that we have to make our mindset. Yeah. Um, so Can I list at least a few solutions then? To, sure. Do I have a please. chance? So one of the solutions I think is really important is shifting, uh, going beyond transactional and uh, just purely transactional and financial relationships. For indigenous peoples, for me, relationships are everything. There's nothing that happens outside of relationship. 
our relationships. There is magic in those in this beautiful word, right? So and get to know your indigenous partners. I work, we work with indigenous communities, so this is, these are our partners, and we create those relationships with them. Um, another challenge in philanthropy, I see viewing relationships as short term, like lasting only one or two year cycles, grant cycles. And the remedy to that would be sub substantive, sustainable and long term support for uh, the partners that we work with that extends beyond one or two years, multi year support grants. Lack of trust is another issue, right? Which is reflected in very strict due diligence processes. Remedy that with easing the burden of applications, easing the burdens of strict due diligence for your partners and really creating those trusting relationships. Um, another one is seeing the issues um, and solutions um, kind of in silos. To me as an indigenous person, my life is not siloed. It's wholesome. My health depends on the food I eat, my, uh, on, on my rights as a woman, um, everything. It's just, I think that we need to adopt a holistic approach. And if we wanna support indigenous peoples, you know, let's, let's not look at them at the silo, in, in silos. Um, so, and uh, I, I also see a lot of organizations using indigenous peoples in their promotional materials. But when I look at the composition of their board and, and their staff, there's not a single indigenous person. So I think that's the issue and that's the mark, you know, we need to change that situation and bring indigenous peoples into their decision making bodies. And finally, devolution of decision making to um, indigenous led funds or to the communities themselves, share your decision making power with the people you serve. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. That was, uh, that was wonderful, Galena. Um, I don't know any two people in the philanthropic world who I think fundamentally understand the power of relationships uh, more than Jennifer and, uh, and Peter Buffett. Um, you're right on. I think that's the, the main shift we have to make. These are two very courageous people who have uh, enormous um, uh, experience all around the world um supporting communities uh, particularly women young women and increasing opportunities for them worldwide jennifer and peter um uh share with us what you've learned where you're coming from what we need to know about the reimagining philanthropy uh okay uh, thank you Spencer. and um yeah you, you that's we're learning constantly, always. Uh, we came into this in a big way in 2006 and have never stopped learning. And uh, first of all, Galena, that is 100%. Those solutions are all right on. And, and uh, there are still solutions for a system that uh, shouldn't even belong inside uh, what would be real relationships if we had them, because they would be uh, the way you described, uh, which I would say in two words is right relation, which is something we're constantly um, uh, struggling with, I think, in this culture is being in right relation, whether it's with each other, with governments, with communities, with uh, you know how we eat, how we educate, everything. And, and that's the ecosystemic approach that, that we're continually uh, learning how to implement. Uh, Wes Jackson, who some of you I'm sure know, uh, has the greatest frame, I think, for our time, which is we're a species out of context. We're a species out of context, and I think that's exactly right. That, that the context that you describe uh, in your, you know, where you had grown up and the, and the kind of, uh, again, right relation amongst the elders and the kids and the community and the, you know, all of that is, uh, that's what we've been for most of the few hundred thousand years that we've been around. And these last 15,000 have increasingly uh, brought us into this disconnected transactional place uh, that we now find ourselves in. And 
that's encouraging to me that it's relatively new. I mean, at the worst case, it's only 15,000 years. Um, and, and for Western society in particular, um, and really the last few hundred, you know, philanthropy really came into being to course correct what was um, what the industrial revolution wrought. Uh, and, and so, you know, it may take us a few hundred years to get out of it, but in the scheme of things, again, that's not too long. And, and so we don't think of ourselves as uh, uh, seeing the change we're hoping to uh, orient towards in our lifetime, but just a, a little bend of the arc. Um, and what else, what else are you thinking, Jen? <laughs> Mm, that's so interesting that we it's sort of like when you have people over for dinner, you find out what how the, your partner thinks and what's going on in their life. So right. thanks for being around the table. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I think, gosh, there's been so much because of COVID, this great pause we've all been in. And I think it's so helpful um, in really having time to reflect about the context we've been living in, about society what works, what doesn't work. And if we don't have different um, systems, we just keep repeating and participating in the systems that we have, right? Um, really see this in education. Like kids are, the education system is not working in this country, yet do we have an alternative? And people are so afraid, you know, they can't send, not send their kids to school because they have to go to their jobs. Now that's not entirely true. And um, because of the pause, I think there's an opportunity to reimagine and reassess what education is and how it works and who decides what it is. And um, that's a painful, messy process. We've been talking about this before COVID happened too, about, um, you know, all the best metaphors are na nature metaphors, right? So, uh, and maybe, maybe we're hearing this a lot now, but we were using it for years actually, but just the caterpillar and the chrysalis and the goo, and that the caterpillar, um, you know, doesn't know what's happening to him. It thinks it's dying. We don't know what it thinks, but it's mm -hmm. experiencing a, a, a huge dissolution of form. And these imaginal cells come online, and then it, it transitions into something completely different. And I think that we're in that phase and that um, in that change. And I think philanthropy has to really has an opportunity to, everybody does, but um, to a little bit pause, really get a sense of out of the denial. I really appreciated Spencer, what you said about, you know, 95% of the money wrecking the world and then 5% 5, 5 trying to do something to fix it. I mean, we really have, in 2008, we saw that too. We saw that opportunity. And I was just amazed that philanthropic institutions were not taking that more seriously um, at that time. And then the crash happened. So we really have to get real. We have to get real about our systems, context, history, um, just all of it, how living systems work, our monetary system, which is based on greed and scarcity, uh, about this transactional model. And I think something that, that's really come um, or hit us close to home in the past year, especially, is just this idea of working where we live because we know it. Mm -hmm. And this sort of um, hubris we've had about going all over the world and trying to help people, I think is really um, I, I'm almost used, I use the word dangerous. I think it's irresponsible in some ways. I think you trusting local grassroots organizations, yes, but um, I think we all kind of need to sort of sit and stay at home and think about what, how we've been behaving <laughs> and um, what's working, the systems that are working and then systems that are not and what they're based on and um, spend a lot more time out in nature, which I think COVID's given us, us at least, and hope all of you, more time to be able to do and to really think and to look at the mirrors in nature for the metaphors and the inspiration um, for this time to help us bridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty more we could say, but I think we'll save it uh, for maybe an answer to a question or what else, uh, whatever else there might be. But uh, no, it's, it's it's moving the money. Uh, sometimes we say at the foundation that we're putting money out of its misery. And, and I think that's what I'm glad Jeff Bezos did put a little of his money out of its misery today. And uh, we need a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. We need a lot more of, of what people are hoarding in all these different ways and people are consuming in all these different ways and, and put it back into the natural systems that have taken care of us for millennia. 
Thank you both. I uh, have to also say, um, by the way, uh, this festival of what works would not be going on were it not for your investment in Salmon Nation. Um, I hope we uh, earn your trust and be able to share some of the, uh, the experience that we've been seeing over the last few days. It's really pretty wonderful. Anyway, thank you again. Um, I, I posted, I think, or we want to post your um, your New York Times op-ed piece because it's so ring so true to me. The charitable industrial complex uh, sure puts a different spin and helps us reimagine uh, philanthropy. Thank you both, uh, Claire Williams. Claire's been trying to turn philanthropy on its head. She said, "Hey, I'm going to go find money that uh, people that need money and give it to them." Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Not a lot of bureaucratic baloney in, uh, in that approach to things. Claire, could you share with us? Uh, she comes from, she's in Vancouver, uh, BC, in the heart of Salmon Nation. Um, Claire, thank you for being part of this. Could you share with us a little bit of your story? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Spencer. Um, it's an honor to be here with y'all. And I love the imagery of a magic canoe. Um, I saw this as a virtual circle, but I like a magic canoe. Um, that feels much more aspirational. Um, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Foundations for Social Change. And the heart of what we're doing is really um, driving meaningful risk-taking to advance social change. Um, and today I'm joining you from, you know, you said Vancouver, but more than Vancouver, I'm joining you from what was once the ancestral village of the Squamish nation called Snock. And um, participating today actually gave me an opportunity to connect deeper to the land and learn about this place that I've been calling home for the last 12 years. Um, in terms of my connection to philanthropy, it's more of a circuitous route, um, a winding path. So in my 20s, I was um, a radical, some would say militant hippie. I was deeply involved in the environmental movement. Um, I completed my undergraduate degree in environmental studies and economics in Ottawa, um, which is on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. And that was actually when I started to connect with Salmon Nation. I was deeply inspired by um, the Clackwat Sound War of the Woods protests, as well as the direct and courageous action of Julia Butterfly Hill um, down in California. And I became mesmerized with this land and this landscape. And so after graduation, I came out here and traveled around and got to know the people and the place and really hoped that I would one day call this place home. And my work as an environmentalist, while it's near and dear to my heart, it was also an incredibly hard journey for me. Um, I took each loss as a personal slight and it ended up in burnout. And so I took some time and space to um, almost take a sabbatical and then eventually return to the space as an environmental planner. And my goal, you know, I took my, um, my master's degree in environmental planning um, with the hopes of operationalizing my love for the earth, my undergraduate degree in really fulfilling what I have, um, I, ca I call my stance. Um, and I think we all need to reflect on what our stand is. And so my personal stance is that I stand for a kind and inclusive world that nourishes all forms of life. And I really hoped through my environmental work that I was going to fulfill that vision. Um, unfortunately, as is always the case, life had, life had other plans. And so I ended up as a consultant on a massive redevelopment project that I would have protested in my 20s. So um, I quit my job and I moved to India to manage a children's home. And my time there um, was incredibly hard, but it also um, highlighted um, the humanity behind some of our greatest problems that we face here on planet Earth, um, abject poverty. Um, and connecting with those humans also helped me connect with the love in my heart to make this world a better place, um, with some of the assumptions I had personally made around people living in poverty. Um, And it also um, showed me how we can create more direct and elegant and simple solutions to some of these problems if we would drop um, our biases and our prejudices. So I returned to Vancouver um, to see a growing number of our neighbors and friends experiencing homelessness on the streets um, here in Vancouver, all down Salmon Nation, um, across the country really, and got to thinking, you know, this is a problem we've been working on for 50 plus years 
And we've been approaching it from this one size fits all solution. And the approach actually hasn't shifted in 50 years, but the landscape that we're living in, the times we're living in have radically changed. So how do we reimagine how we approach this issue? And that's what inspired my co-founder and I to start the New Leaf Project, which is essentially what Spencer said, we take money and we put it in the hands of people who are experiencing homelessness. So we gave 50 people who were homeless a one-time cash gift of $7,500. And then we followed them over the course of the year to see if something as simple and elegant as this could actually help people move their lives forward. Um, and it did. And it's incredible to see the results. We ran our work as a randomized control study because as you can imagine, we encountered so many naysayers when you say we want to give people money because that's what they need. Oh, you can't do that, especially to people living in poverty or especially people living in homelessness. They're going to do X, Y, and Z. And our, our work actually shows that that's completely not true. Um, so just quickly in terms of outcomes, we saw that people very quickly moved into housing, that they spent less time homeless, over 5,000 nights homeless. That's 13 years. Um, that is remarkable. We saw people increase their food security. They Increase, increase their relationship and connection to community. Um, and then we also saw, and this is my kind of darling of our data set and what I'm getting to in terms of philanthropy, is that there was a reduction in spending on drugs, alcohol, and tobacco by 39%. And that is remarkable because it fundamentally challenges everything we believe about poverty, about homelessness, about philanthropy, about you know, charity or social impact. And I think that's really exciting. Um, you know, on the thesis for the Salmon Nation, there is um, a beautiful quote by Donella Meadows, and she says, the most effective point to intervene in a system is the mindset or a paradigm out of which the system, its goals, power structure, rules, its culture arises. And that's what I want to talk about today is what if we didn't need more resources? What if we didn't need more technology or inputs? What if actually we needed was a radical shift and change in mindset? What if we started believing in one another? And that's the premise of our work as much as it sounds a little kind of love and light and people laugh at me. I've always been like, we just need to believe in each other again. And our work is a testament to believing in people really can result in transformative change. Um, and so in terms of philanthropy, we've been incredibly lucky to receive funding from visionary philanthropists and foundations who truly believed in our mission. And we're kind of tapping into this need for reimagining philanthropy. Um, but I still think that there's a lot of work to do within the sector and within ourselves. Um, each of us who come to this amazing work um, come with biases and prejudice, even though we, we're here to create an advanced social change we bring the lenses, which in many cases, I think are preventing us from moving forward. Um, and so that's kind of the question my team and I are sitting with today, both as an organization and in terms of how we work with philanthropists, how we work with foundations and donors, how do we shift the conversation? How do we start believing in one another again? Um, how do we reimagine philanthropy to be what we truly think it can be, which is you know, that sincere love for one another, um, and that desire for radical social transformation. And at the same time, acknowledging that a lot of philanthropy um, is a product of wealth inequality. It's the product of a system of um, power and, and privilege and the destruction of the natural world. And so it's really complex, um, but I also think anything that's worth doing is complex and it provides a lot of opportunity for creativity for us to collectively work together to solve some of these problems in a way that's completely outside the status quo. Um, to start generating um, the change that we wanna see in the world, um, to restore our community so that there's more balance between um, each other um, as well as the natural spaces in which we occupy. And so for me, I think the root of all of this is uh, for everybody that's um, here today and for the conversations you have you, as you move forward is raising that question around like, what do you stand for? And then actually, what are some of your self-limiting beliefs or the kind of prejudice and biases that you carry with you that are actually preventing you from activating that change that you want to see in the world? So, thanks, Spencer. Claire, that was a beautiful and crystal clear um, statement at the very heart of uh, Salmon Nation in so many ways. Um, thank you. Stay tuned. You're a raven. <laughs> <laughs> You're a key storyteller, part of this um, 
of this uh, Magic Canoe journey. Your colleague, Tim, uh, has been at it for a long time. Um, Tim, could you uh, share with us a little bit about your journey um, and uh, how you uh, see a changing landscape of uh, philanthropy? No problem, Spencer. Thanks uh, for having me. By the way, I, I switched my account around so I'll, I can stick around till 3.30 guys. So I just wanna let you know I'm around. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. Uh, I live in Victoria and I'm here, uh, our offices are on the Masonic territory in Victoria here on a beautiful lake called Prospect Lake. Um, so I have the opportunity to look outside and spend lots of time in the outdoors thinking and plotting my next moves. Um, so it's a real, obviously wonderful experience that I have here. Um, I also just, hey, thanks for having me and all these extent, you know, these great speakers that are here today. I'm not going to try to, I'm going to try to add value, I guess, to what's already been said. Um, I think just a few things, just a quick history of me. Um, yeah, I've been in the charity sector on the ask and the fundraising side for 25 years now. Um, I'm a true believer that the success in any relationship, whether it's business or, or, or charity, it is all about relationships. And I appreciate Galena bringing that up because my whole life is being built on relationships since the day I was born. And I think it's absolutely critical in any relationship and any work that you do that relationships are what define you and what will move you forward in life. Um, I uh, our, our just a quick, our, our organization is called Power to Be. Uh, we provide outdoor education programs for young, young families and adults and children that live with barriers. I'd say the why is really, we try to use nature to inspire as possible in their lives. So, you know, we don't talk about what's not possible and about the barriers. We actually tell them, you know, we showcase and put them in nature and give them the ability to see what's possible in their lives. And, and that's the why. And I think similar to what you do here, I think nature has an incredible gift to provide to everybody and the creative ways in which we give and do things. There's a great new book out, Nature Fix. I don't know if you read it, but it's awesome. It's all about how nature really inspires creativity. In fact, it's a pretty inspiring book. You should check it out. Um, that said, you know, we're about a four and a half million dollar privately sector funded organization. So uh, we have quite a substantial amount of money we raise every year. Um, in addition to that, we are uh, this place that I'm sitting on. We, um, we acquired a 70 acre property um, and we're about to build it. We just raised $15 million privately to build what I will say is a world-class nature-based facility, which will speak to inclusion and accessibility. And we have traveled around the world meeting with organizations to get this right. We've asked one question and that question simply is, you know, what could we do differently that you didn't do and, and build on that? Cause we know we're not going to be perfect, but uh, you know, we've done a lot of community collaboration with our participants and our network. And I really hope that we build a, a Jedi chamber, not just of difference makers of helping people live better lives, but bringing people together to actually have conversations and inspire action to make the world a better place. So I feel pretty happy. I'm in a really kick ass place, to be honest with you. So I love where I'm at. Um, that said, I through my lessons in charity, I share quite a lot of stuff here. I think the whole sector needs an absolute shakeup. Um, I have run into roadblocks from restricted Gantz to, you know, in a, inability to take risks and, and do things and fail and make mistakes and being afraid to fail because your funder is not going to fund you anymore because you made some mistake and didn't take a risk to, you know, um, basically being burdened down with grant making and reporting and really, you know, 35% of your time probably being spent on places that, you know, you could be being spent really actually having an impact and actually doing the work that's required. I won't say that fundraising isn't going to change. I, I think it's needed. I just think to your point, we also need a structure where we can diversify revenue. And I, I echo what you said earlier, Spencer, I don't use the word non-for-profit. I think it's a shitty word, it's a stupid word. I mean, I don't know any business that shouldn't or any organization that shouldn't be have the ability to make money to do what they need to do. And the fact that we're limited to do that, that's the whole reason why we're here in the first place is we can't make change because we actually not allowed to make money to go do the work that we need to do. And you can only grow, unfortunately, if you have money and other resources. Um, I think the cool thing about the sector is that we're very collaborative in nature. And I think COVID really defined that. I think that, um, you know, organizations like innovation and creative is about working together to create better change. And I think those that are really care about their communities do that really well. That said, I've also seen, I think, and I, and I echo, I think Claire kind of brought up to a certain degree around homelessness. And I'm no expert in this area, but I, what I have seen in the funding side of it, you got too many organizations doing the same thing and they're not talking to each other and they're all competing for the same resources. They're all protecting their resources yet. They're actually not working together. And the issue only gets worse and worse and worse. 
So even though I know I've seen some charities falling off because of COVID and I feel really bad for that, I think it's a time to bring resources together and collaborate and, and, and merge and amalgamate. And I think those that operate in silo are going to go way of the dodo bird, maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, I truly believe that to be true. Um, and those that are more collaborative in nature are going to shine, which I would say brings me to the next stage in my life. And I was really fortunate from the charitable side of things. Um, someone said, you know, what do you want to do next? And I was like, you know what I love to do? I want to run a private family foundation. I want to give money away and I just want to do it in a way in the exact opposite and what I've experienced to make it actually better. And it's been really interesting because every time I think we do give money or contact people, the word, the first thing I say, people say is where the fuck did you come from? Like, this is awesome. I've never ever in my entire life had anyone phone me and actually have this conversation. And I'm like, bingo, we're onto something here, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So we created a foundation called power to give. Um, we represent the funding interests of a few funders, but what happened really was, um, I watched, um, I don't know if you watched the work of Dan Pallotta and some of his work in Uncharitable. Um, Dan's a mentor and friend of mine. Um, I really, he really kind of helped me think. And I was like, geez, I'm not the only person that thinks this way. At least someone's brave enough to call this thing out, you know, which so many donors and funders are afraid to talk about. And that's just the idea that, you know, this notion that non for profits tend you work for 10% less to do 10% more, you know, overhead's a bad thing we get rewarded for being efficient versus being effective. Like none of this stuff makes sense to me at all. And finally I was like, wow, someone's saying something here. And so we kind of took that message and started to create this foundation around what, how would we want to give? And that was around unrestricted giving. I think to what Galena said, we're about a trust-based philanthropy. So when we meet with organizations, we're not the experts. And I think a lot of people in the fundraising world actually think they know how to fix the problem. when in fact, they don't. And I would argue even Bill Gates would actually say this. I think, you know, he's built a team of people to support organizations that they do. But at the ultimate end of the day, we invest in the leaders and the people that run these organizations because they ultimately know what they're doing. So it's very much based that we ask them to, I'm going to say, give us your outcome. Tell us what you're doing and where you need to go. And we're going to fund you along the way. And tell us the risks that you're taking and the risks that you're managing. So it's very much a conversation. And I, what Taglina said earlier, I, I'm all about meeting people, you know, but we do say, you know, we, when we go back, we say, look, we do need some information, but it's a two page proposal. Like if you can't tell us what you want to do in two pages, we do not want to hear from you. And it's interesting. I, I don't know if there's anyone on the screen watching who actually we fund and I'm sure they'll, they'll laugh at this, but you know, some of them still send me like tons of information. I'm like, I do not need this information. I need two pages. Tell me what you want and we'll go figure it out together. Um, so the other thing is we, we really, started to move into the indigenous world, um, largely because our, one of our focuses is very much around supporting, I'm gonna call it health and wellness and conservation efforts in, or in communities outside of big cities. Um, you know, remote being, they don't have the same resources that um, are required to meet the needs in their community, yet they have to leave their community to go get that help that they need. And that again, creates a lot of issues around relationships, et cetera. Um, we didn't have an Indigenous focus in the sense that it was, a, it was intended, it just so happened that these communities are, were, which, you know, happened to follow through in, in, the, in the areas we were trying to focus on. And what I've learned, and, and, and I would say we started in Bella Bella, I'm sure, I don't know if Jess is on here and Larry, but, you know, I've known them for years and I think they do incredible work. Um, and I'm not their expert. I've learned so much from them. In fact, any group that we work with, and I probably overload them with work because I keep sending other people to go meet them and go to their community because they should go see what they're doing. Um, but we do, you know, we, we really, um, you know, I, I think that they would say that we've really just given money to them to do the work that they need to do. And I've come up to learn and I'm learning more and more all the time. Uh, we funded a health and wellness center um, in, in an area called Kunsun. We used to fund their youth program. We've now funding a health and wellness center up in a house it um, and a new big house up in Cayuca. And the whole idea, I guess I'm saying is we really just go to the communities and ask what they need. And we really try to just give them the funds that are necessary. We do have a funding agreement and I can see how that can be perceived as a treaty agreement, which I, I struggle with at times, but I think what, from a, from an auditing perspective, we need to do it. We simply define an agreement that's based on what the community needs and wants, and then we let them go drive it. So that's the way I think we try to remove a bit of that bureaucratic, you know, old school way of doing things that can create stress on a community that maybe is so used to, you know, that type of work. The other thing I'll just add, and just, just to say, um, um, I'm a big believer, you know, again, moving forward is, is I really hope that 
all communities are given the opportunity to take more risks and, and, and really, you know, do what's right for their community and, and work with people that actually really want to work with them and work us alongside them. And, and don't get in the way. I think, again, a lot of people that join boards who come from really prestigious business backgrounds think they can fix the issues when, in fact, they create more interference than they do in getting the work done. So a lot of this is due diligence, I guess. Um, I'm just in a lucky place that I feel like I get to test these things with. And I would say we work with a funder who truly believes in what we're doing. Like, I, I love the fact, you know, I report to one person. I don't report to a board. We sit down over a cup of coffee and a phone call and we make decisions on $20 million ask. Like, I love it. Like, it's the best thing in the world. And from that, what we've done is last but not least around collaboration. I think there's other people, and I'm not saying, I think the old school philanthropy, you can't change, but there are people that are inheriting wealth. There are foundations that want to do things differently. And COVID, I, I did see it. A lot of even corporations and public foundations said, screw it. We got to get money out the door right now because if we don't, we're not, in fact, as a foundation, we probably won't have a job because we won't be able to give to charities anymore because they're all going to be gone. So they removed all the red tape. And I'm like, I hope you learn from this. And I hope you actually don't go backwards. You actually go forwards. So now what we've done is we've, we've, we've created a, a private kind of quiet group of philanthropists that really want to do it differently. And we bring in people like Dan Pallotta to educate, and have conversations. We don't ask for money. We simply just get them on, join them on the ride. And as soon as you get on the ride and you build the relationship and we're on this bus together, things just start to happen. So um, I hope that helps. Um, I thank you for having here. And yeah, I, Claire is one of our fundies. I'll be happy to say that. And uh, we've really enjoyed working with her and watching her grow. And there's someone who's taken some serious risks. And I'm well aware of the circumstances in which she's under and the pressure that they're under to do things. And I think they're trying to do the very best that they can to see things through. So, you know, I'm hoping that we can continue to support organizations. And that's kind of where I'm going at the same time, trying to transition out of power to be to kind of take this gift and go kick some ass. <laughs> Tim, that's a, uh, that was terrific. Uh, if, uh, if all philanthropists were like you and Peter and Jen, we wouldn't have to reimagine philanthropy, would we? That bus of yours sounds a lot like a magic canoe. Thanks so much. Three years, three years. I promise you, I'll come back with a very different conversation. <laughs> well, that's okay too. We do that daily. I don't know if you know, by the way. Uh, you know the um, uh, when the Kuwait went on the market uh, oh, yeah. for sale. Uh, there was a friend who was on the board at the time, named Howard Buffett. Um, who saw the proposal, called me up, said, hey, uh, we're going to do it. I said, what do you mean we're going to do what? They said, that thing you sent me about the Kuwait, the, um, yeah, we're going to do it. I said, what do you mean we're going to do it? They said, well, you told me you need a million dollars. Peter and I are going to send it to you. Uh, that's what brought the Kuwait uh, land back to the, you know, in, the, in, the, in that restoration, that incredible story that, uh, uh, you know, the Kauai and, and, and uh, Larry and, and Jesse and uh, the whole crowd. Someday we're going to entice uh, Peter and Howard to come out there and see well, what they've done. And I'll close, I think I'll just say to add to that, I think with, with proof to the pudding, and I went there years ago, we actually did a relation, a partnership where we brought kids living with cancer up to, to Kauai and spent some time with their youth. And it's a super powerful experience. I mean, we would have loved to kept doing it, but again, cost was just travel. And then you know, funders like, hey, this money could be going somewhere else, re re not recognizing that the impact that this had was like over the off the charts. Yeah. Um, but just needless to say that what I have learned and seen too, and I'm going to say, I think this to everybody, but I think it's, I've seen specifically with indigenous communities, but I think more and what I've seen more and more requests is it's all about getting people back on the land and reconnected to the land and reconnected to their language and reconnected to the places that they need. And that's what we fund all day long. And I don't even ask the question. I just go and hang out and learn and spend time with really cool people um, <coughs> I never would have had a chance to do before. And that money has given me the ability to go into these communities. And I, I like to believe build some authentic relationships. <coughs> I can't speak on the behalf of people they think of me, but I like to believe that's what's happening. <laughs> okay, that's terrific. Uh, Tim, thanks so very much. Uh, one more. Um, we're coming back to nuts and bolts. Uh, Susan McCormick is a... Is a uh, <clears throat> partner, senior partner at Morrison Forrester in San Francisco. It's a prestigious big law firm. And uh, she leads the practice on uh, <clears throat> energy and social enterprise and impact uh, investing practices. Um, uh, Suze is uh, 
trustee of the Salmon Nation Trust. She's our counsel. Um, she's a friend. She believes in what this is all about. And um, she's helping us develop whole new sort of structures to tackle this problem. <coughs> Sue, some, sorry, could you, could you tell us a little bit about your background, your story, and also how you led to, uh, to Salmon Nation? <coughs> Hope you're okay there, Spencer. Yeah, happy, yeah, happy to. Um, I won't share a lot of background because I want to I want to get to the nuts and bolts and the substance. I would say I'm the anti hippie. Um, I grew up in rural North Carolina, home of Jesse Helms, uh, Republican family. Spent the early part of my career. I always liked the environment and being outside, but I am a corporate lawyer. I facilitate the movement of money. Um, and several things happened in 2001, but I will summarize it by saying I took the red pill. And as soon as you see the environment, the degradation of the environment, um, and my husband at the time was a volunteer, had quit tech and was, was working as a, a, a Presidio a park steward. I used to argue, you know, joke that he, you know, sort of did good while I made money. And once you see it, you can't unwind it, you can't go back. Um, and I saw it, and then the rest of my career, I've been trying to shoehorn sort of sustainability and particularly climate, um, but it's led to a lot of other things into sort of mainstream corporate forms. And there are three points I wanted to make related to philanthropy. One, a little bit of a counterpoint to what everybody has said on this call. I do believe in the power of relationships, but I also believe you need scaffolding because in life, relationships sometimes go badly. And scaffolding to me is the form and substance around an entity, around a corporation, around a group, around a community, Galena, around a town where somebody lives, how it forms and how it organizes. I used to think it was all about the scaffolding, the corporate form and governance. I now believe you can actually have a fabulous organization with fabulous people and relationships and no scaffolding. Or you can have really good scaffolding and really, really crappy people. And, you know, but so you actually need both, but you do need the scaffolding and the governance and form. And that's what I focus on. Second, on governance, if we are to turn philanthropy on its head, which I think we also need to do, governance and what is considered good governance, and this is what I teach on at Berkeley Law School. Um, and now I get to advise people like PG&E on, on, on what good governance looks like. What is good governance tends to be or has historically been top down, right? You good governance is a board and managers, you know, dictating how they are controlling and managing an organization. Um, and that's at the for-profit level, at the nonprofit level, you have, you know, you have trustees, you have board members, they are charged with, they're at the top, sort of charged with, you know, making sure that things are following a certain framework. You don't have to follow that model. And one of the things that I love about Salmon Nation is the fact that when they came to me, um, they were turning governance on its head. You have ravens, you have trustees, you have an entity, a PB, a public benefit LLC, but that is run by the managers of it. It's not a top down and you have a public charity and it is much more horizontal instead of vertical. And that is a, an incredibly powerful governance tool. If you talk about sort of new scaffolding, the other new scaffolding is the public benefit LLC is the fact that we now have legal forms that are between a foundation or a public charity on the one side and a for-profit on the other. And I was involved in drafting the first of them in California. And I think the power of shifting the scaffolding can just help. You still, I still I go back to Galena, I agree. It's all about the relationships, but putting some scaffolding around the relationships to make them function better and, and, and to meet the goal. I don't want to use the word efficiency to meet the goals of the people involved, I think is really important. And the third thing I will say on philanthropy is you said 5%. By my numbers, it's not that because everybody overcounts philanthropy. And Bezos is 10 billion. I'm just going to give you some numbers because I'm a numbers kind of girl. Global debt right now, 253 trillion. Derivatives, people don't count derivatives, estimated. Four, 350 to 400 trillion dollars. Real estate, 280, 300 trillion dollars. Stock market, 100 trillion dollars. I'm just taking indices of the mainstream, the money that is sort of you know controlling the scaffolding. What is philanthropy all in? 
maybe a billion. So we're talking about a, a 10, you know, a, a less than a percent, 10 percent of 1 percent or whatever that math is, a, a really small fraction. You also have the issue with philanthropy that, Peter, I kind of agree that the public charity was formed to deal with the issues of the Industrial Revolution. The private foundation was really set up to allow for accelerated charitable giving and to give the wealthy people in this country a tax break. And then all of the rules haven't really been updated since then. So. Um, the issue with the private foundation is it was public charities are designed to deal with big issues, right? Private foundations were designed to provide long-term funding for the arts. They were actually not designed to tackle these huge problems. So when Tim talks about being creative and, and Peter and Jennifer, I know you being creative, there are legal constraints back up to what I said, the scaffolding around what you can do. Cause you gotta, your job is to maintain a whole pot of money so that it's there in a hundred years so you can keep funding stuff. That's neither good nor bad. That's, Peter's not doing it. That's, that, that's the design, but it's the, the design of the foundation is fatally flawed. I think we need to get out of the foundation model altogether. If we're gonna use charities, we use, we use public charities. And now we have a bunch of other things in the middle that are designed to tackle these, these huge, these huge issues. Is this better with my mic? Sorry. Um, so uh, my view is sort of making money of exactly what Spencer says, you know, making the money and giving it away on the side is, is just a flawed methodology. We also have to change the mainstream capital markets so that the companies, the investors, everybody who's in the, what did I come up with? What is after a trillion? What is that number? It, it equals that. It's, it's, it's 998 by my calculation, trillion dollars. That money has to be deployed differently and it can. And what I tell you, what, what gives me you know, hope is that we have tools now to do that and people are starting to do it and explore it. And we have to do it because we have existential threats. We, we just, we, we're not going to exist as a human species without it. So for me, this is not something, a little side project I do. It is the world that Galena's family, you know, gave to us um, coming in it, here. I, I'm assuming you're in the Bay Area, you know, is we're not preserving. It's not going to be here. We're not going to be able to continue to function there's not going to be a world left for my children and so we have to change not only philanthropy fundamentally but also how business how business operates so there you go spencer <laughs> hey it is exactly three o'clock you guys are a, a miraculous um thank you uh Suze, uh, um so so i had the one one uh, thought susan that is this public benefit llc it was new to me uh, when we first uh, came to talk with you and say, how might we build out the social architecture of uh, Salmon Nation? Could you say a little bit more about what a public benefit LLC is and the ability of a foundation to give money or to invest in such a beast? Before we get rid of foundations altogether, yes. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll, I'll take a step back. People talk about B Corps. A B Corp is just a certification mark. It's not, it's, it's, it's good in as far as it goes. It has some issues with it, but a, a company that is a B Corp pays money and licenses a mark. And that is a very important distinction from the underlying corporate forms in the U.S. And I will say, having studied what's happened, the U.S. is is behind other countries. Uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, there are countries that are way further ahead in terms of the corporate form. But the PBC in Delaware, the PBLLC, the SBC, to some extent the benefit, every state is different, but generally they allow you to have a mission to be a for-profit entity with a mission, but your board and management have a fiduciary duty to that mission, the same as to making money. So these are, these are not charities. They are not nonprofit organizations. They have shareholders, but there is a dual fiduciary duty that they have. And that is that can be a game changer if you are required and you can be sued if you do not focus on the mission that you have agreed with your shareholders. So that's why you're a PBLLC. <laughs> and that's why we also created a new uh, 501c3. Uh, and Public charity. All yeah. the courses finding more and more ways to build out whole 
Spectrum Capital to support these uh, remarkable people who are doing good work, who are what we're calling uh, dancing at the, in the spiral dance at the edge of chaos. They're out there with one foot in the old, new, one foot in the new, uh, building uh, fractals, uh, uh, initiatives that are getting tangible results around a new way of doing business and taking care of the place we call home. Um, questions, um, other panelists, um, and then also we have some uh, coming in from some of the audience. Uh, there's, uh, are there any panelists that wanna, wanna get back to, uh, to Suze or to any of the other panelists about some of the things we've talked about? I would just say you inspired me to think that, that uh, getting rid of philanthropy, if we got rid of the concept of externalities for business, we would probably get rid of philanthropy because it would cost so much uh, in a positive way to actually do the right thing mm -hmm. for all of the externalities that aren't counted uh, in business practices that philanthropy would go away, I think. <laughs> I, I still, there's still gonna be a need for philanthropy because I think there are certain, um, you know, there, there, there are certain elements of our society that are purely or should be purely non-commercial, so not handled by business. But if we limited philanthropy to that, and or used it to provide first loss capital to take on the high risk to de-risk it so it can become a commercial enterprise. I think it, it would be a, just a much better model. And you don't, the other thing I say on foundations, foundations should not be giving money for research projects to test out to see what, what kills me is you have a good idea. I love Claire's model. You have a good idea, you know, philanthropists give you a couple hundred thousand dollars to test out the idea. And then like five years later, somebody does something. I mean, what is that? You know, it sounds like, you know, no, you know, stop, stop giving these, and, and you have an entire, and I'll just say class of people that are dependent. You've got the people with the money and then an inordinate amount of people around them who are making money from the money before anybody, anything, you know, actually gets to, you know, I'm sorry, I'll <laughs> shut up. <laughs> no, that's exactly what we need to be talking about. Uh, there's a question about divestment and working with foundation family offices and investor assets to get out of the harmful 95% and, and uh, back to, uh, you know, so is this whole business about impact investing, um, do the panelists think that we've made any progress? Is it significant? Is it going to important, useful things? What do you see, Suze? Mm -hmm. You're muted. Um, I think I'm unmuted. I, you know, the question of divestment is difficult. I personally, if, if I'm to take my portfolio and divest, you yeah. know, from oil and gas because I care about climate, those companies are continuing to operate. So who's going to be owning them if I am not and working with them? We have to get them. This is why I like shifting the fiduciary duties to shift. Um, and in terms of impact, uh, you know, impact capital is output positive, so they're not going to invest in Chevron. Uh, um, are there, somebody asked, are there funding organizations in the U.S. we know of that share the mindset of both uh, Claire and Tim and uh, what they're doing? I'm sure there are examples of that. I don't know many of them. It's almost too spectacularly um, perfect to imagine it being in the U.S. of A right now. I guess that wasn't. I would say that there is. I mean, the, the one run place to look would be the Whitman Institute. They're a very trust based philanthropy foundation um, doing some pretty cool stuff. They're actually winding down their, their foundation. They're actually just spending all their money. But it's, if you just want to learn about trust based philanthropy as an as a educational tool, it's a really cool, um, um, it's a great website just to go from and just learn from. Um, but no, I, there's definitely a lot. I mean, I was just talking with Dan Pilata today, and uh, there's definitely foundations ironically enough i will tell you he told me this today this is interesting he sent his book this kit that he had it's actually a pretty cool kit that he has and he sent it to 100 ceos of united way and by the way i can't stand united way i'm not even gonna go there today we'll just leave that that by the way that should probably not be on this thing either i just just the way they function is completely flawed um anyway all said this just proves my point he sent this book and asking if they'd be interested in kind of evolving their practices he didn't hear, but he heard from three people of a hundred. And one of the three said, 
don't ever write me again. I don't want to hear about your information. So that just speaks volumes about some of the attitude in the current, I'm going to call it old school foundational thinking that's happening at this time. So and it's just interesting. Peter might take you on uh, on the United Way. <laughs> He's been singing his story all across the country. Yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's just, you know, I, I get to understand the will, but it's just like you give money to one group to give it to, you're basically passing, it's like a throw through thing. And, the, and then there's not a lot of due diligence going on and sort of the work that needs to be done. And, yeah. and ironically enough, I understand where it came from, but it hasn't evolved is the point. If it had evolved, it'd be a different situation. I had a CEO that said to me, he goes, I don't understand how my team gives more money to your cause and your events than I can't get them to give United Way. Well, I said, first of all, I think, you know, you, you ask people to do this. And in the corporate world, there is actually, it's become this kind of, it's really interesting United Way, especially, I mean, I've heard it from people, young people that, you know, get into the business. If you don't give United Way, people are watching, then you are a bad person. Like you're not part of the actual, the culture of the team. It's not about them wanting to give. They want to give to cause. They just don't want to be forced to give to something that maybe they don't agree and believe in. And so it really becomes you better give or you're not part of our culture. So again, you've disconnected the reason and the purpose why you're doing it in the first place. And I would argue that I've met CEOs of those firms in those conversations. I was actually doing a presentation with one of them, whatever, for a firm that wanted to market the United Way. And I, as I was in the elevator, I literally turned to her and I said, I just want you to know, I'm not going to say anything about our organization. I'm here to promote United Way because I just needed to get that out of the way. I just didn't want there to be any tension. And uh, it was just really interesting because I can just feel the tension when I walked in the room. It was like, okay, if you'd say anything about your organization and steer any money away from us, you know, we're going to, it was just, it was just interesting. So I'm sorry, I'm divesting. I, I, I'll, no, no, that's all right. Uh, there's another question uh, from uh, somebody out there that said, uh, that says, I would love to know folks uh, that uh, take on the radical strategies, like spend downs, reparations, community-led investments. Um, um, spending down is one way to pour it on. Um, may, may I mention something? Yes, please. Uh, land purchases. Uh, when I was working for a private foundation, um, I wanted to make a case for uh, land purchases for indigenous peoples. And uh, it was a hard one. It was a very difficult, it just rubs people the wrong way some, somehow. And that's the most important thing for indigenous peoples, getting their lands back. And I think that philanthropy needs to understand we, in this country, in the United States, we're living on the lands, uh, stolen lands of indigenous peoples and they need to get their lands back, so. Yeah. An example of that over in a house that there was a residential school that was removed and um, the condition of the church was that they were gonna give it back and they never did. And they actually had to buy it back, ironically, and raise money to buy the land back. It was absolutely absurd. Um, anyway, I just wanna say two things. I actually wanna echo one thing that Sue said, I think that did get missed. I actually do really appreciate the conversation around governance and you do need a wrap around this. You do need good governance. It's super important. Transparency is critical in everything that you do. And I just think as much as there needs to be different and as much as look, foundations are restricted to how much they give. I think that needs to go away, but there are regulations that need to shift and change in systems, but good governance is really important. I do think really good boards actually get that and I, I just want to say I don't want to make sure that's steered away from the, the governance is super important as well I just had to make that comment yeah. but we can rethink governance too it Absolutely. doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be top down with the you know a few people yeah I, comp I, I completely agree with you because when you look at the structure of an organization you have this board that, that has an upper hand you know and, and the staff and we all should come together from the place of equity. And I think we should elevate the staff to be in that place of equity. And we need to talk to work with the board so that that inequity between the staff and board doesn't exist. So how- do nation doesn't have a board. They have trustees <laughs> that are really only there and I am one if they go afoul of the mission and we shut them down. That's, that's, that's our job is to make sure that the canoe stays on the water Mm -hmm. and doesn't like start selling, you know, land rights to, to big oil companies. So that's our job, right? So, but otherwise there is no board. And then you have, you have the power of the people who are running it and the power of the Ravens. Hey. One other, Spencer, one other, just I mentioned about the US, one other base, if, you, if, if people are interested in giving, 
or philanthropy side of this philanthropist watching. The other group to look at is the philanthropic workshop. They're actually out of San Francisco, TPW it's called. Um, and I really like the way where they're going. Um, it's actually, I was at their workshop, I was at their conference just before COVID hit in Napa. Um, but just to simply say, I actually like the way they're going. They're trying to be more proactive. The chair of the board is from Vancouver. She, she's very much involved in trying to shift the way they do things. They're trying to focus on equity. I was actually part of their European um, gathering. The cool thing about virtual experiences, you actually don't have to go to England. You can actually sit online and do these things, even though I, I don't like virtual stuff. I won't lie, it drives me nuts. Relationships, I'd rather be talking to someone in person. Right. Um, but just to simply say, that one of the cool, their, their real emphasis was around equity and really learning how to give better and be better. And I actually really, it was, the, it was my favorite workshop and I really enjoyed it. So there are people trying to do it better. It just needs to be done more and it needs to get out there more often. So that's another resource to think about. There's, and there are wonderful people in that community that I've met that uh, are doing some really wonderful things. And, and I actually would argue it's that kind of, I'm going to call it 50, maybe it's five to 15 million, 50 million kind of that wealth. I mean, most people think the billionaires, I mean, I get it, but I think the people that really want to do more and kind of the billionaire, is that sort of a, I'm going to call it a lesser sense of income because they, they want to give and do more. Whereas the billionaires just give money, which is great, but they don't really bring the resources to the table sometimes too. It's just, it's just interesting watching different demographics of people who have the ability to give. I just think it's time, talent, and resources. You bring everything to the table to make it work. It's, I think Jillian said earlier about, it's not just about money. It's about like we literally bring expertise and we will support and find resources to support organizations all day long, all day long. Hey, Tim, it'd be great if you and, and indeed other uh, panelists would kind of post uh, some of these, uh, some of these connections. You mentioned Dan Pallada. I don't, I'm not familiar with him. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you is there a chat. Is there a chat on this thing? Yeah, yeah. there's a chat on this thing. And, yeah. and put, put TT, TPW on it as well, because TPW and Spencer, I think you know, we set up a, one of these new corporate forums. We aggregated capital for micro business in California. It's going to be announced by the governor on Friday. Um, and TPW, there, there was no, again, we had a flat governance. And so we also didn't have any, any big money supporting us. And TPW is the first that got behind it. But now it is... It is a uh, billion dollar loan fund for micro business, 80 to 90 percent will to be to companies, micro companies in the smallest, the, sorry, the poorest regions um, in the state. And we've made sure there's good geographic spread as well. Um, and it's, yeah, TPW, we're, the, we're, we're sort of early and sort of volunteering to help us get that launched. And now it is fully launched, but it's one of these new forms, but you avoid all the fees in the middle. It's not a fund, it's a PBLLC under a public charity. So you can aggregate the capital, take first loss capital and not pay a bunch of money managers, a whole bunch of money and not have studies. We can actually just start getting loans, you know, micro loans out to people. We also aren't bundling the selling of the loans. So the banks that are coming in don't have control. They can't they can't force defaults. Again, it's the power of using some of these new forms. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, that was PT. I'm just adding this stuff for you guys now on this chat as we're talking. And I just want to talk a minute to the idea of spend down and that uh, all this money should be moving. I mean, nobody should be saving any of it for future generations. You know, we're going to move everything now over the course of our lifetime. Uh, there's no reason to be sitting on a billion dollars or 10 billion or, or half a million or whatever the number is that you've got sitting to give away. It just it's, it should move. It should move obviously thoughtfully. And I think one of the problems is people that have made a lot of money, they're smart because they made a lot of money and, and they may be smart at the very limited thing that they, you know, and this includes, well, okay, I'm not gonna start to <laughs> name names here on this live stream, but yeah. the idea that business people, once they've made it, uh, think they're smart in how to give it away uh, mm -hmm. can oftentimes be ridiculous. I mean, sometimes that's not true, but most of the time it is, I think. and. The idea that again you're going to hold on to it so that your kids can do it and then their kids can do it and then their kids can do it you know my dad is moving it to us and we got to move it all out we give more than five percent away every year we give a hundred percent actually we have a pledge and and sometimes it's 110 or 120 percent of what we have and to stick to some five percent number you know payout number especially when overhead can be included is ridiculous. I mean, that, that it, it's, it's just, it, we're in it right now. And, uh, you know, there's the great line moving at the speed of trust. And we, 
do our best to live into that every day. Um, but that means it takes a lot more work to be in a relationship, uh, a lot more time. Um, but it, yeah, it's just, and everything Alina said in terms of longer grants, operating, uh, uh, you know, people that, that are connected in the organization to the people you're actually uh, supporting and, and uh, you know, working with. Uh, and there are a couple other ones, but they all were exactly how we're trying to operate every day. And it, it's, it's all about trust. It's all about giving people the time and having patience and not having crazy reporting procedures and all this kind of stuff that just bogs down the system uh, when people should just be doing the work. Hey, Peter, can, can I ask you one, one question? I think you know, it'd be really interesting to all of us. Now we're looking for deep systems change. And, and you and Jen have been, you know, making incredible, you know, hundreds and hundreds of contributions all over the world now for a long time. And uh, as I understand it, you're sort of taking a deep breath a little bit and say, ooh, the exponential degradation of life support systems in this age of the Anthropocene is a whole new world. And so take a deep breath, rethink and dive really deep. Uh, where do you see the opportunities around this kind of fundamental uh, idea of systems change? Well, it, it, it is local. It is exactly what you're doing and what we're talking about. The other quote I love that I can't, I don't know who said it, Jen's heard me say it a gazillion times now, <laughs> is the abstract without the particular allows the demonic. The abstract without the particular allows the demonic. That is the world we're in, whether it's job numbers, GDP, stock market numbers, everything else, it's all abstraction. And if you're living in the world of abstraction, you know, the price of a forest, the price of a, you know, a, a fishery, whatever it is, you can do anything. And we've seen it happening now for the past couple hundred years, if not more. So we've got to get particular, which means relationship, which means, you know, knowing where your food comes from, knowing uh, who or, your neighbor is. Or going to or see wherever that was that you went and you saw, you know, what was happening with the extraction there. I don't know right. if it was a mine or a forest or I assume it was the Northwest. Yeah. But to yeah. have, you know, an experience of, of the effects of what we do. So we're going very deep where we are. Uh, we're also doing it with other people, other places, but, but here we are uh, working again with the food system, uh, how the kids are educated, uh, how the healthcare system works, how the government works. It's, it's a pain in the ass in terms of the complexity of the relationships, but it's beautiful because uh, it, it is, you know, and, and I will say, talk about taking the red pill. I mean, it starts with me, it starts with Jennifer, then it starts, and then it, works out between the two of us, understanding our programming in relationships in this culture, in this time, slowly undoing that and, and then working out from there. So it's, it's just going really deep, first inside yourself, seeing the program you're running, seeing how it affects others, and then seeing how that in the fractal nature that everything is, mm -hmm. uh, how it spreads from there. And uh, yeah. yeah. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> well, that's that's really pretty great because that's, of course, what uh, you know. I've been almost fifty years, mostly nonprofits, um, and desperately trying to get away from the hierarchical mode of making decisions. Even a nonprofit, you know, a, a board, a chair of the board, a vice chair of the board, a president, a bunch of vice presidents, an annual plan, the yeah. strategy, budgets, and oh yeah, yeah, you can. That's the opposite of nature. Sorry. Exactly. Um, yep. And trying to rethink and go back really local with right. this individual fractal of, of an, a, what we call raven in the spiral dance at the edge of chaos. Somebody mm -hmm. that was committed to home, who's a soul of fire, who's going to make a difference and leave home a little better than they found it. And the stories of those individuals and what they're doing, they're all totally different and they have basic principles that they share. So our mm -hmm. hope is that these little fractals, the storytelling of ravens, mm -hmm. which coincidentally is also the colloquial name for a flock of ravens, <laughs> these <laughs> stories uh, start to paint a more vivid picture of what salmon nation, what a new economy might look like, new relationships could look like. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like, well, geez, you started with 35 ravens. I mean, what is that gonna do? 
Uh, now there's what, 80? Well, what's that gonna do? Well, now there's, I don't know, 600 that are participating one way or another in this, uh, in this festival of what works, what is working. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I hope it turned into, we gotta get exponential to even right. begin to keep up with the cascading collapse of, uh, well, I didn't need to get on up on my <laughs> horse. Well, I mean, I, I, but I do, I mean, I just think that th this is, we're, we don't live in a country, we live in a very successful colony and, and it's not going to last. I mean, this, this place will dissolve like everything else does, you know, nothing lasts and we will be networked bioregions. I'm sure of it. <laughs> and, and Salmon Nation really inspired that for us and to recognize that we, there will not be geopolitical boundaries at some point. They were made up once and they'll go away. And the only thing that will last is the ecosystem we're a part of. If we last, it will, but, and hopefully we will within it. Final thoughts from uh, any of the other panelists. Um, um, what else? Uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. Claire is such a, has a little tidbit burning in her brain, and, and I know her well enough that she doesn't say enough of what she actually thinks and says. I just want to say, Claire, you got anything you want to add here? I haven't really heard much from you. <laughs> Sorry to call hey, you. Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just sitting with the question of trust. And I also am sitting with um, the connection, uh, the question around interconnectivity and what Galena said around um, indigenous ways of knowing and being and the relationship with the land. And what's sticking with me is um, I once heard, and, and I don't know who it is that told this story, but the first kind of sign of civilization was when they found somebody, they found a skeleton in Africa where there was a healed fracture in the femur of that individual. And that was the first indication that we were moving towards civilization. Because if you are a human being with a fractured femur, um, chances are you're not gonna make it unless somebody cares for you. And so it's just raising the question one for me around connection to land and how land then, um, that connection with the land helps us to connect to one another that in it, and it helps us see that interdependence more easily. And because we have moved so, far away from that, especially in urban centers, it's almost broken our responsibility to one another. So how do we bring that Lang piece back in to connect with that responsibility to one another, to care for one another again? So um, that's what's burning for me right now. Thanks, Tim. You're welcome, that was great. Good. Galena, any final thoughts? Oh, thank you so much, Claire. This just brought us, I think, everybody home. Uh, I just wanted to share that, um, I'm co-authoring a, a series of articles on indigenizing philanthropy. And I think the two articles are ready. One of them is posted and we will be finalizing two more and we will be hosting a webinar on December 15th, inviting prominent indigenous leaders in philanthropy. So I welcome you to on December 15th on cultural survival. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you all. And can I, can I, Spencer, just encourage anybody out there, if you end up with new money, I mean, there is a trade-off between, I kind of said this, between all your advisors who are going to tell you to minimize tax and having impact. And I think if you can avoid setting up a foundation and having a lot more flexibility in terms of deployment of capital, um, for to all of the fabulous organizations. And then we can also at the same time, you know, work on, on changing the recipients and how they use it. I think uh, that might be helpful on the philanthropy side. I'm working on changing the mainstream corporate too. There but. you go. <laughs> I can't go <comment. laughs> Okay, folks, it's uh, 327. Uh, we've still got three minutes, um, but I think you've done a spectacular job. Uh, uh, addressing this huge issue of uh, reimagining philanthropy. We're on the precipice. We're building new systems. I like where it's going, but boy, we got to crank it up a whole lot. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I think, uh, let's see who's back there. Um, uh, Donna, are you uh, ready to take it from here to the next step? <clears throat> She's not talking to us. She's in a different uh, setting. Anyway, thank you all. Welcome back. Um, that was that was a pretty big deal. It's brave when people.
talk directly about money. It's, mm -hmm. it's brave when people challenge any of the conventional wisdom about power, sharing power, and money. Yeah. And we heard some really big things. Yeah. I, I loved that um, Peter Buffett talked about the fact that we live in a successful colony. Yeah. I've in the past described Canada as a blue chip banana republic <laughs> in terms of we have all of this respect internationally mm -hmm. for being an industrialized state. And we're not. Mm. We're an evolved colony. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's something about being real about that mm -hmm. that's really poignant. I really like what he said about it's not about hoarding all of this, but really putting it back into the natural systems that have been taking care of us for so long. And that's that's really, uh, we, we need to do that if we want to survive right now. And it's not about hoarding. What are you going to do with it? Like, you can't bring that money to the grave. Right, right. And in Galina Angorova, who I admire greatly um, from Cultural Survival, talked about a lot of really important measures that would democratize and make philanthropy more relevant mm -hmm. in this time, including using it to buy land. Yeah. Because when you're talking about the interests of indigenous people, it's all about land, mm -hmm. it's all about place. If you really want to invest in indigenous communities around the world, you have to help people get their land back. Mm -hmm. It's how you decolonize. Mm -hmm. And speaking of um, some of the projects that Tim was talking about with the uh, Kunsut Wellness Project and Cux Society, Project Society, which is uh, Quay, those are really awesome projects about um, bringing indigenous communities back to connecting to their lands, to their traditions. Um, and there's the Kunsu Wellness Project is a really beautiful project that you can actually see the video um, that Salmon Nation and Magic Canoe Production created on the Salmon Nation website. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's wellness through a healthsick lens for the people, by the people. Uh, what can help their communities? And it's really about getting out of the way and letting the communities, you yeah. know, fend for themselves. Yeah, and I love that, I love that Tim Kermode um, invoked Dan Pallada, who's very controversial. We should drop some of Dan's stuff into the chat to help okay. people understand why. Um, but he really challenges that we've built and trained nonprofit organizations to be efficient, not effective, right? If you look at the grant reports of every foundation or the grant reports of every nonprofit in North America, mm -hmm. you'd think everything was fixed yeah. based on what people report out on. There would be no homeless, there would be no sexism, there would be no inequality <laughs> if the grant reports mm -hmm. told the story. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. We're not structurally taking on justice. We're not structurally taking on living within planetary boundaries mm -hmm. through conventional grant cycles and the nonprofit industrial complex, mm -hmm. right? This is about reinvention. And I thought Suze McCormick talking about the structures of philanthropy and how we have to restructure organizations in order to do this work, that's also part of the heart of the matter. Mm, and I love Claire's project with giving uh, homeless folks $7,500 and seeing what that can bring into their lives and how that can shape and change. And just to put things in perspective, our office is currently on Maine and Hastings in the downtown east side and I've done quite a bit of work in the downtown east side and uh, worked with Atira and, and all these different um, organizations and there's there the nonprofit world is is difficult to create really big movement and change and no matter what you try to do it, it's hard to get these big pieces moving so I really really appreciated Claire's work yeah and speaking of this neighborhood, one of the organizations that did spend down, which is another important strategy, the Enswell Foundation, which was financed by Carol Newell and run by Joel Solomon, they took a $30 million inheritance and spent it down in 10 years mm. and built the movement that protected Clackwood Sound, that built the movement mm. that protected the Great Bear, that put money into coastal First Nations communities directly. Mm. And so they didn't sit on their assets, as they say. They spent them down to change the moral and the land and the cultural fiber of the province of British Columbia. Mm. So people need to get a lot more radical with their money, y'all. Mm -hmm. That's what this yeah. panel just said, and that's what we 
heard and that's what we're really grateful for having heard mm -hmm. and connecting with people it's not just about writing a check and then just not showing up like right. people are connecting with communities or connecting with folks who are are in need of these of this funding to create better um, programs in their communities so uh, yeah that's it was really inspiring thank you so much